Hi, and welcome to Newsmakers for insight analysis and behind the scenes commentary from Santa Barbara's top journalists about the most important news events in our community. I'm Jerry Roberts. Tonight, in a special post election wrap up, we look behind these headlines. The youngest and the oldest candidate emerge from the free for all assembly race for the two spots on the November ballot. Das Williams holds off the challenge from Laura Capps, but bruised feelings on all sides of Santa Barbara's progressive community remain from their epic first district race. A late burst of campaigning in IV appears to have saved Supervisor Joan Hartman from a runoff. And in our political remax segment, we'll talk about whether Salud Carbajal would rather run with Bernie Sanders or Joe Biden at the head of the ticket. Our panel tonight, Delaney Smith, staff writer for the Santa Barbara Independent. Josh Molina, who covers politics and policy for NewsHawk. And Nick Welsh, executive editor for the Indy. Thank you all for coming. So Delaney, on the assembly race, let's start uh, close to home. Mayor Kathy Murillo uh, appears to have fallen just short, or at least short, in third yeah. place, <laughs> not making the runoff. Were you surprised that she didn't do better? No. Um, I, I, I <laughs> I expected Kathy to be in third place. I thought maybe she'd be in second, but it, it was unlikely. Um, in the beginning of the race, I didn't think so. But um, I, I, I think she made third place because she doesn't have any Ventura connections. She said she did because I think, what, in the 90s she lived hey, there? Don't be dissing the 90s. I don't think anyone remembers her living there in the 90s. Thanks. I don't think anyone remembers her living there in the 90s. Steve Bennett, however, um, he has five terms as supervisor in Ventura, and then he was a city council member before that. Yeah, he has he's almost, a moldy piece of bread. <laughs> right. <laughs> he's a moldy piece of bread with almost three decades of um, knowledge, experience. And he was and a teacher. He probably taught half yeah, for, students. Yeah, for two decades before city council. I mean, it, it goes back a long time, so he has so many connections in that community. And then... Although he didn't have any connections in Santa Barbara, he had the Santa Barbara independent endorsement, and I, I think that made the difference. I really do. do I you? mean, I do. Yeah. And although Kathy was second place in, I do, seriously. No, I, I do too. I, I, I don't Although disagree Kathy was second that. place just in Santa Barbara um, County, um, if you're not adding the numbers together, Steve was much, much, much closer than if you look at Ventura County, where yeah. she was much further behind. Yeah. So this is the first time in the <laughs> 21st century that Santa Barbara will not have the assembly person from, from this district. Do you, uh, I mean, you've talked to Bennett uh, enough. Do you think that's going to be a, a problem for people here being heard? I don't think so. I think Bennett is connected enough, and I think Santa Barbara County Democratic Party probably will embrace him. So I think it will be maybe an issue at first in terms of people getting to know him better, but he's the kind of guy who, if you planted him here would be extraordinarily popular. You know who so. won't be talking to him? Or won't, is the, the real estate lobby here. <laughs> uh, they spent, what, 850000 well, yeah, yeah, at this point? 700 the last time. To checked, so. smear him and Cassie Murillo. And, and they were really smears. Too, yeah, really? I mean, it was he was the moldy bread, she was the chatty Cassie, and the, and the local real estate guys were going, great. He's going to win, we know he's going to win, and why is he going to take our phone call? Uh, after this campaign. And and they were doing it on behalf of Jason, who got, what, almost 7%, something like that? Yeah, their, their taxes ta uh, tactics didn't work at all, really. Um, Jason did not, none of the other candidates did well, and, and that's because Cole took the big chunk. Um, of the R's. That's Charles yes. Cole. Charles Cole, 22-year-old, dropped out of City College because it's too radical. Yes. Is that right? Charles no. Cole. Well, he, he went to Josh's class. So that's, that was, that's that was, what, the that was it. <laughs> That was, that was the end of that. You were didn't. teaching secular humanism <laughs> in the guise of journalism? Delaney and Charles Cole were in the same room for 80 minutes. Um, I have no recollection. We don't, because he, <laughs> he was in the back of the room and well, So uh, your guy, Abood, uh, who you were... <laughs> that would be Jonathan. Who, yeah, uh, you were pretty high on. He, he, he kind of underperformed, huh? What happened there? I don't know. Uh, he's very popular in Isla Vista and among young people, and he worked really hard. He did. I, I think that 
maybe there's just so many Democratic candidates that there's just not enough to go around. And Kathy had the greatest name recognition. Jonathan's going to probably do very well going forward, whatever he decides to do down the road. He has enough time. I think maybe people are looking for experience. They're looking for a little bit more than just somebody who's eager with lots of ideas. Steve Bennett is the total opposite of that. Even Kathy Murillo's got that service uh, as council member and mayor. A lot of people were ahead of him in terms of people who could demonstrate, here's what I've done, as opposed to <clears throat> the ideas. Uh, he does work really hard, though, and he's a good campaigner. It's just sort of the timing was not right for him. And he was not at the Democratic celebration downtown, Jonathan. Is that correct? Yeah, well, he, he would have been in IV, um, and I think he showed up for a really brief period of time, but he left because uh, he, he was... So is he, <laughs> but is he on the outs of the party now because he kind of went against Kathy? Yeah, there'll be some bruised feelings, but I think they're going to get over that because Jonathan is a very good organizer and he's been very good at getting out the vote in Isla Vista. And I think that people who can deliver what he can deliver uh, have something to offer that the party needs. And you talked to Charles on election night. Mm -hmm. uh, did he seemed to understand this was probably going to be the all downhill from here? Um, no, he did not seem to understand that, even though he, he, uh, he did say that he acknowledges that likely the reason that he won was solely because he was the only Republican and not because of his campaign or any of his values or points. Um, he did say that, but he didn't, he didn't seem to understand that there's there's absolutely no possible way in November he will win this. <laughs> so uh, do you think we should have four Bennett coal debates uh, set up uh, for the fall? No. No. <laughs> okay. All right. So, uh, Josh, in the end, it appears that uh, Doss Williams won a smashing 735 ballot landslide. Um, is it, there's still 40,000 ballots out, though. Is that going to make any difference? I don't think so. I think that typically the leads grow. Uh, we're talking about Doss Williams, who's endorsed by the Democratic Central Committee. They have a huge get out the vote on election day. And I think he's probably going to benefit from all of the people who voted on election day more so than Laura Capps. Uh, just by the numbers, Cops, um, Doss has, has more on the ground volunteers than Laura Capps does. Laura Capps may not... Did. Did. <laughs> she may not agree with that, but the party's network apparatus is just so large, and they were doing it for everybody on the ticket. So, yes, there's a lot that are left, but, I mean, she would have to have so many more. It would not just make, it would not make sense. Mathematically but, but, not no, but, but isn't it the case, Nick? And, <laughs> no. And you'll agree with me <laughs> on this. That while typically the ballots that are that come in late are liberal or or left ballots, that this time in the specific conditions of this um, uh, election, a lot of people were holding on to their ballots because of the presidential thing and waiting to see if Biden was going to be viable in South Carolina. Did you? Did you? Is that from Infowars or where'd you get? No, that? no, no. It's true. It's <laughs> absolutely true. It is true. It is true. I mean, nobody thought Biden was going to get like twenty five percent in in it's California. Out, yeah. So, you know, so no, the spin is, you know, from the, the from the camps, camp, camps, camp is, uh, yeah, that those that the Biden voters are going to be more, uh, you know, friendly to Laura. And that it, so that, yeah, I know, don't know how if it's going to break that way or not. I, I do know that. I mean, I, I waited it's a lot for of the, votes. It's a lot of votes. And it's actually what, 8000 votes yeah. in that district. Um, you know, a lot of people held on to the last minute, and um, I think that for, for Laura to make up 735 votes is going to be statistically almost impossible. Um, it could happen, but I think it's likely that uh, typically the latecomers are the party uh, people, and the people that the party shakes the bushes and gets them out, um, and that's going to fall more... Um, do you right. think that really? Uh, well, I mean, yeah, I just, I mean, if, they, if it was based on the presidential ballots, I'm not sure that people in the party, so to speak, would necessarily be more for... More, no, I don't think, I don't think, yeah, I, I don't think that the party, I imagine in Santa Barbara, obviously, it was a, a Bernie, turn, you know, Bernie won Santa Barbara County. All right, now here's another scenario. 
uh, Delaney, that there were 200 write-in votes, which is a lot of write-in votes yeah. for, for that. So How many did you get? Huh? How many did you get? At least I, I'm going to find out. So, so, okay, so say this is hypothetical, obviously. So say she narrows it a little bit, and then more they find more and more uh, uh, write-ins, and then Doss goes to 49.9%, and there has to be a runoff between the two of them for the next eight months. Do you think there would be any difference in the result if they went on for another eight months? Yes. Yes. Ah, Nick, yes. Yes, because. <laughs> Quit mansplaining. <laughs> yes, because um, I think that Laura's received probably a lot of feedback from the community about the number one thing that I hear when I'm on the ground is that people think that her campaign's too negative against him. And I think if she had a chance to continue her campaign for months longer, she would definitely change the direction and learn from what just happened, and it could it could go completely different. And how about Doss? Well, he's a good lawyer. I don't think I he's. Understand. I don't yeah, think. I, I don't think Doss Jerry, would change his tactics at all. Jerry, but. I have to say, you are in such denial here. You, I mean, that, 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 that's a question. I mean, somebody is in a dark room, going, "Oh my God, is I'm not going to wake up in the morning and to face a Doss Williams dawn," and, and they're trying to conjure some sort of pass out of the I'm darkness. I'm just telling you what. Uh, I, I, mean, I know what you what heard. People, what just, what you, just, just what people said. You know, Mike and Soker used to say that too. People want me to run. So. Well, that's what Doss said. He wouldn't have run. He wanted to go to Sacramento, but everybody in Montecito begged him. They just he, please. I've never heard him say oh, that. Oh, he said that. He at said the, he wanted to stay in Santa Barbara because he, he has a family. He said at the at anyway. He said at Laura's the one who said people came said, to me and asked her. To run. Well, that and, which is true. That's which is actually actually true. So. Uh, do you think that the Santa Barbara uh, Independent editorial uh, made the difference? Was it determinative in this case? Well, I, I think that it is influential, and it probably is worth at least 500 votes. So, yeah, it's probably something that did make a difference. And then the fact that so much attention was drawn to it, probably, I know Laura Caps probably thinks that it helped her, and maybe she was able to get some votes or raise some money mm -hmm. off of it. But... At the end of the day, it just draws attention to the fact that Doss got the endorsement. Got the so, endorsement, yeah. I mean, I think you know you're. Uh, yeah, it's all your fault. I, you, you, you've been <laughs> you've been very very concerned throughout to the point where you <laughs> recused yourself from this race, allegedly, uh, about the Step hurt thing. feelings and the hostility and the intra-party feuding that would go on in the progressive community. Where how, how do you think that stands on a scale of one to ten? with 10 being maximum nuclear war and zero uh, being in. You know, I, I think it's going to take some uh, cooling off. Uh, you know, within party insiders uh, and activist community and the environmentalist community, there's going to definitely be some bruised feelings. Uh, and with, in certain camps, I think there are going to be more than bruised feelings. There are going to be serious contusions and lacerations. But, um, you yeah, know, we'll get over it. Do you agree with me no. that <laughs> that it is incumbent upon Das to, to not, be gracious, to not be a, a sore winner, and to be gracious? Are you trying to paint me into a, a no? I'm, it's a it's a yes well, or yeah, no yeah. question. <laughs> no, I think Das should say, oh, you know, you know, this is a time for all of us to come together and heal, and I need to learn from my mistakes, and you know, the fact that somebody who is so popular and so. Uh, established um, came this close to getting knocked off, you know, he has to look at that and go, what did I do uh, to put myself into this position? And we all know. And did you feel when you spoke with him on election night that he was in that uh, reflective, kind of insightful uh, uh, state of mind, Josh? Yeah. Well, we all know that, that <laughs> Doss Williams sees his former enemies when they embrace him as a sign of integrity, not a badge of, of shame. So. I'm sure he'll openly accept Laura Capps' apology and we'll put it all together. <laughs> yeah, that's going to happen. <laughs> um, no, uh, when I talked to him on election night, he seemed um, Bitter. pretty, pretty uh, happy that he won, obviously. He did say that, I mean, I think the direct quote was something like, the reason she got so close was because of people have so much respect for the Capps' name. Uh, so he's a little mad at her. He's going to take the digs at her. Um, 
I don't know what Laura's future holds, but we will all find out, uh, you know, the, sort of the conspiracy theories around DOS where he cut a deal so that no Republican would run. And when <coughs> some oil thing comes up to the Board of Supervisors, he's going to side with them. Uh, all the proof will be in the pudding. We'll, we're going to find out eventually. And I guarantee you, if he does anything even close to supporting uh, Plains All-American, that uh, those CAPS people are not going to be happy with that. I mean, he, you know... They were smart to go after Republicans. I mean, it, it, Republicans in in a race like that are just another interest group, right? You know, like in, in any other interest group. So you know, that's what they used the independent expenditure for. That was a smart thing to do. And she kind of you know attacked him for doing that well, in a I way agree. that would drive away. I mean, she it seemed to me she had an opportunity among Republicans, didn't she? That she did not take it as a lost opportunity. You no, know, she actually did because I mean. Uh, we were there when she announced and she was talking about she wasn't going to be uh, such a creature of the party. <clears throat> she was going to reach out to everybody. And so she was going to be much more ecumenical in her approach, whereas Zoss is much more seen as a representative of the Democratic Party. Um, and so, yeah, she didn't really do that. She missed that opportunity. All right. Um, and then in the third district, Joan Hartman He's still over 50%, I guess, right? Yeah. 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 So uh, were you surprised that she has apparently, at least for now, pending the 40,000 ballots that are out? Well, I guess it just shows that... Um, in fact, I believe you sat in that very chair last week and said, no, she would not. Uh, I, um, I, was, I was happily surprised. <laughs> um, that means that that is a race we don't have to cover in uh, November. Uh, she was running There's against no a, race to a field of four. And so statistically... Uh, it seemed unlikely that she was going to get to 50% plus one. But Bruce Porter was such an odd uh, mix uh, of incongruent parts. And who was the real Bruce Porter? You never really knew. Um, and she got 10,000 10, votes were cast in Isla Vista in the last day. Last day. So that is um, kind of, I think, what made it. Yeah. I mean, she did well enough where she needed to in the valley up in San Ynez, but I think either of us how, much, how much oil money did he have? Do we know? I think it was somewhere like 60, 70, 80,000 bucks by the end of it. Now, technically, the oil companies gave money to the Republican Party, and the Republican Party then did mailers against her. And they were not particularly original or interesting, or they were kind of generic. Uh, but they were nasty, and they always had Tree pictures. Tree hugger uh, type of yeah. thing. She yeah. was a socialist. Oh, what was the best one? That she was going to um, force, they were, they were going to seize the gas car, you know, gas-powered cars uh, from drivers. So, I mean, they were making these claims that they were going to seize your car. Um, <laughs> and they were using the socialist word, and they were kind of getting into the Republican hysterics. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and speaking of being a... A, a good winner. Have you reached out to Bruce Porter to try to, re, re, you know, rebuild that bridge after he's viciously attacked you throughout the campaign I, for um, exposing his nefarious efforts at voter suppression? I asked one of our interns to do so, um, <laughs> and he said, "I will never speak to anyone who is from the independent." Did he really? Mm -hmm. You're not making that no, up. No, this is. I'm not making them up. I'm saying it right now. <laughs> wow, that's uh, that's kind of uh, uh, harsh. But, okay. I know. All right, so uh, <laughs> then we got uh, Andy Caldwell did okay. He did all right. 44% against uh, um, Salud Carbajal. Salud Carbajal, who, who, again, was not here for election night. He sent another hostage tape into KYT, which they played all night long. It was, he really looked like he was trapped in his office. Um, so here's the good news, okay? Andy Caldwell is not Justin Fareed, so we have that going yeah. for us. Uh, also, October 17th, put it in your book. I don't care if the Dodgers are playing KYT debate between... Uh, um, you guys can be up on, on the top of the mountain with the wind blowing? <laughs> yeah, we'll do that one again. Can you get a helicopter? So here's the question. Uh, Andy Caldwell has already been attacking Salute as a socialist. So if Bernie Sanders ends up as the presidential nominee uh, of the uh, Democratic Party, would he would 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 Caldwell have a chance, or do you think it's just the the registration is just too overwhelming? I mean, 
nothing against Andy Caldwell. Um, he has a large constituency, and he's been very active in politics for a long time. And he knows his stuff, and he's a good guy. I mean, he's, he's a nice, conservative dude. Uh, but the, it's just, he can't, no, no Republican, unless they're a celebrity, is ever going to be able to overcome that gap. And Salute is, he has conservative support, and he's somebody who's well-respected. I just don't think the numbers are there for anyone to overtake Salute, unless they're like one of these transitional crossover candidates. Um, will the Bernie thing affect him? Yeah. Probably a little bit, but I don't think um, he would win anyway. I salute famously endorsed Beto O'Rourke about right. a week before he crashed and, and then Kamala Harris yeah. and then she lasted about two days so after his kiss of death he, he <clears> wouldn't <throat> do uh, uh, I, I tried to find out before the election who he was going to uh, support vote or for vote for and no, Noel wouldn't wouldn't tell me but what would salute do if he if he was like had this uh, socialist uh, presidential candidate wrapped around his neck. I mean, how... Uh, you know, Salud is so well-known in Santa Barbara County, and I think lesser well-known up in San Luis, but uh, he's been, now he's two terms. Uh, you know, that's just silly. I mean, it, it's a nice gimmick. It's, it's sort of, again, it's Republican hysterics. You know, bring out the S word whenever you, you I mean... And there's Andy saying, I spent well, half my life. Well, Bernie is a socialist. Well, Bernie is a socialist, but Salud is not. You know, Salud was a guy who was trying to cut, give away sweetheart deals with, uh, you know, the, uh, with Rick Caruso and the Miramar Hotel. I mean, uh, he's very transactional and he's very uh, pragmatic, moderate, middle of the road Democrat. And the idea that he's a paragon of socialism would make. Bernie Sanders run for the hills. The thing, the, the, every election night on TV, they, they always say, well, what, what surprised you on election night? And I had to say, like, nothing surprised me about this election. Did anything surprise you? Joan surprised me a little bit. Did it? Just I be, predicted that. Um, Did you? Yeah. Really? Yeah. I thought you, okay. Well, I, I mean, it wasn't shocking, but that was a little bit of a surprise. Um, but no, I, th I think every, literally every other result I actually predicted. <laughs> yeah, did anything surprise you? Were there anything that you didn't expect to ha happen? In terms of the results, nothing surprised me. It was pretty much the by the book, textbook stuff that. They're all any, Duraka Democrats. Anyone right? who's like non emotional about it could predict, like, that's logically how it's going to turn out. Um, I was surprised by Charles Cole when I interviewed him because he was a lot less awkward one-on-one -on -one in that moment really? and then he came across in the debates and he came across like, kind of just really happy and pleased and he thinks he's got a chance and you know we'll see what I mean well you predicted Laura would win though so that must have been a surprise to you well hey there's still a lot of ballots to be counted. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> there you go. And, and of, the right is. There's the right is. I want to make sure that you know, everybody's vote everybody's counts and matters. Anything surprised Anything surprise yeah, you? Yeah, I was surprised me was how well um, Joe Biden did. Yeah. That surprised me. Um, I, you know, the, the Biden bump was way more than I expected. That was really surprising. So locally, no. It was all, I mean, the fact that Joan got over the finish line, that was <laughs> a surprise, but not a shock. Yeah. Um, the, the Biden bump was big. Yeah, and the, I think the only thing statewide that surprised me was that uh, Proposition 13. Yeah, that went down. Really went down. But that's an that's a, that's a unlucky number. Come on. Well, it is, and it isn't. I, the guy who put in the assembly who put the thing on the ballot uh, now has got a bill in to retire Prop 13, that you can't use Prop 13. <laughs> no, it's like the 13th that's, floor, right. That's what he, but I think it was a sticker shot. $15 billion bond at this point, it, it just seemed like it was too much. Nobody Money. even looked at it. Well, you Nobody, know why? Because no. there was a PLA thing in there. There was a... Oh. Yeah, there was two things. There was a sweetheart Palestine thing... Palestine liberation? Uh, no. no. There was a sweetheart <laughs> thing for developers where they, were, you, they would waive school impact fees uh, if they built multifamily um, so, uh, units you know, near transit, which, okay. was, which nobody kind of looked at. And then there was, yeah, all of it had to be under huh. PLA agreement. But that, so that assumes that... You don't think the voters drilled down no, into that? No, I don't think anybody... I don't think anybody gave it even a, 
a first look, let alone a second look. So do you think that people thought they were voting against the real Proposition 13? I think people just kind of got down to it and said, what are we doing here? And Prop 13, that's not, you know, anybody who remembers what Prop 13 was would just go, no. All right, real quick, uh, one non-election story. So the city attorney uh, now has a emergency ordinance, I understand, for vacation rental, the uh, for vacation rentals, the James Fechner Relief Act of the two. 2020. What's what's that about? <laughs> uh, so uh, cities involved in litigation with vacation rental owners, and they James have said Fankner. James Fankner, uh, uh, Theo Kraki, and they both have said that the municipal code does not explicitly state that they cannot have vacation rentals in areas that are also zoned for hotels. <clears throat> and the city lost, um, you know, to Theo Kraki. They lost a preliminary judgment to. Uh, to uh, James Fankner, who, uh, you know, you never want to be on an opposite end of Fankner. He's, like, wickedly smart. And uh, so what happened was uh, Ariel went in there and decided, well, let's City just change attorney. the municipal code. It's an emergency ordinance, and this will give them leverage when it goes to court to say it's in our municipal, court, uh, municipal uh, code. Why is it an emergency? We need to preserve affordable housing, and if people are putting them out as vacation rentals, how can people who need housing live in that? Isn't this because he's he's getting, he's taking a lot of heat for, for too much litigation and and biting off more than he can chew and losing too many cases? Well, he's been losing a lot of cases. Or the city attorney's office has been losing a lot of cases, and the preliminary uh, uh, procedural ruling in this case um, was against the city, and uh, so he was trying to change the language so that uh, it affirmed how the city has been interpreting what a hotel is and how hotels are used to um, regulate uh, vacation rentals. Would Even if they got a pass, which they did, I mean, what difference does it make? The judge is going to look at it and, and, say, and say, you know what, you cheesy. put on a raincoat, but you're still the same person. And um, you, you haven't really changed anything here. And, um, Raincoat. I, I don't understand that. Usually, I get your well, you know, metaphors, but I didn't get this one. Usually, get his non <laughs> yes. How about lipstick on a pig? Lipstick on a pig. Okay. All right. There you go. So, is he on, uh, ten seconds? So, is he uh, in danger of uh, losing his position? Is Paul Casey going to throw him under the bus? Um, I don't know, but I, you know. No. Yes, I think no. he's. I think he's in a volatile situation, and he better be close to perfect over the next few months. All right. We'll leave it there. Thanks to Delaney Smith, Josh Molina, and Nick Welsh. Thank you for watching. And uh, please visit our website, newsmakerswithjr.com, to check out my blog posts on politics and media in Santa Barbara and beyond, and where you can also painlessly sign up for a free email subscription. And check out our YouTube channel for an archive of past shows and interviews that will instantly relieve your insomnia. Thanks again to our peerless director, J.P. Montalvo, to our crew, Sean, Mark, and Ryan, and as always, our senior, top-ranking, high-powered, high-energy executive producer, Hap Freund. Thanks. We'll see you next time on Newsmakers. <laughs>